Hello, my name is Mark White, and I'm the Executive Director of the New Mexico Museum of Art. The museum has been proud to host and partner with El Rancho de los Golondrinas on the Winter Lecture Series. Out of an abundance of caution, we have decided to host the program virtually for the foreseeable future. However, we look forward to welcoming everyone back to our historic St. Francis Auditorium when the situation is safe for both the speaker and the audience alike. In the meantime, I hope you're looking forward to the lecture series as much as I am. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Daniel Goodman, director of El Rancho de las Golondrinas. Thank you, Mark, and good evening. My name is Daniel Goodman, museum director of El Rancho de las Golondrinas Living History Museum, and welcome to the 2022 Winter Lecture Series, Speaking of Traditions, right here on the Golondrinas Live Sessions. Like Mark said, it's our hope that we'll get to see everyone in person at our next lecture in the St. Francis Auditorium at the end of February. El Rancho de las Golondrinas has been putting on this lecture series since 1999, making this the 24th year. And we're happy, happy to be partners with the New Mexico Museum of Art in presenting this lecture series. Everyone can support both Golondrinas and the New Mexico Museum of Art by becoming members. It makes a difference and goes a long way in supporting both of our organizations. Just check out our respective websites for details and to join from the comfort of your own home. In case you didn't know, we are celebrating our 50th anniversary this year, and we are hosting 50 events for 50 years. This lecture is event number two. And today, January 25th, 2022, is officially El Rancho de las Golondrinas Day, as proclaimed by the New Mexico State House and Senate. Thanks to Representative Chandler and Senator Stefanix for sponsoring this memorial. But tonight, we're honored to have John Mulhouse speaking on his recent book, Abandoned New Mexico, Ghost Towns, Endangered Architecture, and Hidden History. John Mulhouse started the City of Dust blog in 2004, dedicated to photo documentation of the numerous derelict historic buildings and abandoned places along the Georgia-South Carolina border. Following a move to New Mexico in 2009, he began to explore the history of entire towns, rural places often forgotten, by all but those who still live there and love them. He's collected thousands of images of the state's past as seen from the present. He remains a hunter of ghost towns, empty houses, endless ribbons of asphalt, and more. He currently resides in Norman, Oklahoma. Please welcome John Mulhouse. Thank you everyone for tuning in tonight. I sure wish I could be there at the St. Francis Auditorium in Santa Fe with everybody, but times being what they are, we're going to have to um, pivot back to the virtual presentation, but we can still learn a little bit about ghost towns tonight, thanks to El Rancho de las Calandrinas for making this work, and um, again, thank you all for being here. So my talk is called The Ghost Towns of New Mexico from the Old West to the Atomic Bomb and Beyond, so I'm covering a time period from just about the late 1800s through World War II and uh, into the 1960s, so kind of covering a lot of ground there. This is the first Presbyterian church of Taiban, New Mexico, just about my favorite ghost town building to visit and photograph out on the Eastern Plains. You may have seen shots of this elsewhere. A lot of people take pictures of this. Um, it's just a charming place to be, especially on an evening um, like the one shown in this photograph. So um, what I'm gonna talk about the road ahead, as it were, is just a quick background on how I ended up spending so much time in ghost towns some definitions and types of ghost towns in New Mexico so that we're kind of all on the same page when we're talking about ghost towns. Then a short survey of New Mexico ghost towns, just looking at a few of the different types specifically. And then we'll end with a little ghost town philosophy and some, some musings about why we seem attracted to ghost towns. This is a convent in Roy, New Mexico, built in 1897. I believe they stopped using it about 1970. It's just a beautiful, evocative building out there in Harding County. Harding County, I believe, is the largest county in New Mexico. It's, it's the least dense for sure. Um, Roy itself is not a ghost town, and I'll talk a little bit about what we mean by, by ghost towns shortly. Um, so I began photographing when I was in Augusta, Georgia for graduate school. This is about 2003. I was a you know, biology program nothing to do with history or photography, but I became really interested in the old buildings I was seeing around Augusta. 
I'm from Minnesota. I'd never seen buildings this old before, let alone ones that were sort of derelict or abandoned. Like this one, the Goodale Inn, which was built in 1799, one of Georgia's oldest unaltered buildings at the time, listed on the National Register. Some famous politicians lived here, some famous military people. When I took this photo, it was essentially open to the elements. You could walk in the back door, walk up and down the stairs. And um, in Minnesota, these buildings just don't survive the winters if, if you don't maintain them. So these were really um, charming and evocative places to me. And particularly a farmhouse I used to visit was torn down before my eyes. And that's when I thought like, I really got to document these places like the Goodale, which itself was sadly torn down in 2017 after some efforts to restore it uh, failed. So that building is now gone. That's a theme we're gonna sadly see throughout this talk. Um, a lot of these places are vanishing quickly. So photography is what really led me to my interest in history. Um, I still shoot a lot of film. I do admit to getting a little artsy sometimes. Um, this is a Pentax K1000 that I really stupidly left here on this Cormac McCarthy uh, quote in Knoxville, Tennessee. I wish I had that back. It was broken at the time, but now film has kind of come back around and it would be worth repairing. Um, this is the Escondida School shot with 120 film. Um, this was taken with a plastic film camera. I tried to duct tape it to keep the light leaks out. These are, are um, very cheap. They're called Wokas or Holgas. Um, very difficult to control. I love the unpredictability. Um, I kind of love the vignetting. And film kind of keeps me honest. I don't really take that many photos, um, you know, one or two and I'm done, not much post-processing, but I also use digital means. I use my phone, whatever's at hand, but I feel like my best stuff is still with film. This is the Escondida School in Socorro County, very near I-25. This school is in much worse shape than in this photo. The roof is caved in, I believe, and maybe the back wall has even collapsed. So once I finished graduate school, I began to look at the photos I'd taken and kind of put them up online. Blogs were very popular back then. Um, and so I began to put them in the blog format. Um, and as I put the pictures up, I began to research the history of these places and um, just began to go through my archive and see what I had. And that's when I began to learn that a lot of these buildings had really fascinating histories, fascinating um, people who lived in them. This is an example from New Mexico. Um, uh, not one from Georgia, but this is Cedarvale, New Mexico, which I'll talk about again shortly, um, but just an example of, of what the blog posts look like. And then um, very quickly, people began to leave their personal recollections, which I didn't really expect. People began to leave their own personal histories, family histories. This is a good example from Encino of somebody's father, Henry Boots R., who managed a gas station in Encino. And this was stuff that I wasn't finding elsewhere and I began to feel like maybe the blog was really serving a larger purpose, um, kind of becoming a repository for information that you couldn't find elsewhere. So I really um, dug deep into it at that point and really tried to keep it going. And it is still going to this day. You can still go and visit it, even though I haven't updated it now in probably a couple of years. So in 2009, I moved to New Mexico looking for old buildings and in fact found entire towns to go photograph um, with, with many buildings. This is a good example. This is the Harrison House in Encino um, in Torrance County. This is a place that I photographed, I didn't know much about it, and the family contacted me and said um, 15 kids were raised here. I believe it was 15. They had a five-seater outhouse, just you know, really amazing to imagine that going on here. And sadly, this is another building that has since collapsed. It's, it's just a pile of, of lumber now. I've heard that somebody took the door and rescued it. Um, I hope they're putting it to good use. Um, but this is a good example of a place that I was told about by people that um, live there, knew it very well. So those are basically the ingredients that I put into this book that was published about a year and a half ago called Abandoned New Mexico, Ghost Towns, Endangered Architecture and Hidden History. The subtitle is pretty unwieldy because it's not just ghost towns. I have the St. James Hotel in there. I have the Mills Mansion in Springer. I have some, some places that are maintained but are, are interesting. And the abandoned component is really the publisher's series. So not every place in the book um, is, is abandoned by any means. But there are a lot of ghost towns. The majority is ghost towns and somewhat abandoned places. So unfortunately, the book 
is not available for the most part right now. Um, there's a reprint on the way, it's sold out, which is great, but I wish you could buy it right now. There may be a copy or two in some bookstores in New Mexico. Ask your local store and maybe they'll have it. And hopefully um, it will be available again soon. It may be stuck in a container ship somewhere in the ocean. I'm, I'm trying to figure out where it is. So we should really get some definitions um, right now so that we're all sort of on the same page. So what is a ghost town? Is it a place that where nobody lives? It's inhabited only by ghosts. This is a great view from the Elizabethtown Cemetery looking out over the Moreno Valley. Not a bad uh, final resting place. So a town can become a ghost when the population is significantly smaller than at its peak. That means it doesn't have to be zero. Um, sometimes people get upset when you refer to the place they live as a ghost town, and there actually aren't many places that are totally uninhabited. So it just has to be much smaller. And then the main reason that it has come into existence has disappeared, um, and we'll get into that in a moment here. So these are the definitions that Philip Barney uses in his fantastic ghost town book, New Mexico's Best Ghost Towns, a practical guide from the early 80s, which is a book that I've used extensively. This is Coyote in Sandoval County, which actually is a complete ghost town. There's just some foundations and some fence posts left. Um, but very important that it doesn't have to be zero. There actually just aren't that many totally uninhabited places, although we will see some in this talk. So New Mexico um, actually has a lot of places that we would consider to be ghost towns or semi-ghost towns. And there are really four main reasons for that or four main categories. Um, one of them is mining, which kind of, in a contemporary sense, began in earnest in the mid to late 1800s. Um, many settlements popped up quickly when gold, silver, copper, et cetera, were discovered. Um, and some of these towns really boomed. And then the towns would disappear pretty much just as fast as they arrived when the minerals ran out. So this is the head frame in Hanover in Grant County. This was the site of a pretty famous miners' strike. Hispanos uh, were looking for better working conditions, and a pretty long strike ensued, which was documented in a film called Salt of the Earth, um, which was banned as communist propaganda for a long time, but you can now happily see it on YouTube for free. Um, and it features a lot of local people. Um, a lot of local um, miners actually were the actors in that film. So um, the internet does, does turn up some gems now and then. So agriculture is another big reason for ghost towns, particularly places that were founded in the late 1800s to the early 1900s. Um, when homesteaders came west on sort of what we think of as 40 acres and a mule. Um, but in fact, the Homestead Act of May 20th, uh, 1862 really provided for 160 acres. And so a lot of people came west on, um, by train, by horse, and they would find the acreage that they were assigned. And some people would see a scene like this in Torrance County, um, landscape like this, and they would get right back on the train and go home. But a lot of people did stay and try to make a go of it. This is a um, very stark scene near a road called the uh, Negra Trail in Torrance County. Just shows a landscape that is really, um, really harsh. And you can see that this would be a very challenging place to, um, to be long-term. So in New Mexico, the railroad is also another big reason that we have um, ghost towns. So the railroad required water for steam locomotives early on. So it had to stop pretty frequently um, to take on water for the train. And along these stops, settlements would develop. And of course, there was commerce. People would get on the train. People would get off the train. They might get a meal. They might stay at a hotel. And so um, money was changing hands. And um, some of these towns really thrived. This is Ancho down in Lincoln County. This is the old depot, which has not been used in quite some time. Um, and we'll see a little more about Ancho uh, in a minute here. So finally is the bypassing of Route 66 by I-40. Um, there are other towns that were cut off by other highways actually, but Route 66 is a big one um, when I-40 came through in the 1960s. This is, um, the Budville Trading Post, which like many places, found itself cut off from customers when I-40 came through. I-40 is just actually back behind this building. This is Cibola County. Budville has kind of a tragic history. Um, the owner and namesake of Budville, um, Bud Rice, was murdered along with 
an elderly um, employee of his. Um, the case was never officially solved, although the person that uh, committed the murder or may have committed the murder um, reportedly confessed from prison before he died. But a um, little bit of a tragic story there in Budville. And then the categories do blur a little bit. Um, some of these towns had a mix of things going on. So uh, Montoya is a good example of that where it had agriculture, it had the railroad, it had Route 66. And so though all those influences um, helped Montoya to um, kind of thrive for a little while. And then as they began to um, diminish, Montoya found itself in a little bit of economic trouble. And now there's really nothing left commercially speaking um, in Montoya, although there are some, some ranchers in the area. So I should mention just briefly that New Mexico has a lot of wonderful ancient places that also fit the definition of ghost town, um, places that I love to visit like Pecos Pueblo, Chaco Canyon. Um, I spend a lot of time in these places. This is a bowl. Um, I can't tell you where that is because it's still out there, but I love to, to go to these places too. But this is um, beyond the scope of this talk and I would get way out of my depth if I tried to um, talk about, about these places right now. But just thought I would put that out there that yes, um, I actually do consider these to be ghost towns as well. So let's look at some examples of each type of ghost town in New Mexico. We'll just go a few, go through a few of each type. Uh, this is Lingo in Roosevelt County, um, which you know was known for agriculture out there. This was the post office. Sadly, it burned down a few years ago, so that building is no longer there. Um, this is Fiero, which is right next to Hanover in Grant County, um, another mining ghost town. So Chloride is a good example of a mining ghost town that you can actually um, go and visit and spend some time in right now. It's west of I-25, northwest of Truth or Consequences. Um, Henry Pye discovered Chloride of Silver here in 1879, and he was promptly killed by Apaches. But there was enough um, silver here to keep people coming. And so by the mid 1880s, the population was up around 500. It's now down to, I think, 11, maybe even less. Um, there's a lot of myth and legend about a lot of these ghost towns. For example, this tree is often referred to as the hanging tree in chloride, although um, it doesn't seem like anybody was ever hanged from that tree. It's across from the, the old saloon. So teasing out fact and fiction is often difficult in these histories. Oftentimes, I'll just talk about both because the stories that aren't true are also interesting and kind of illustrative of um, how people lived back then. So chloride was hit by the panic of 1893, like a lot of mining towns were. It destroyed the mining economy in many places. That's um, At that point, there was too much silver in circulation and not enough gold, and so silver was devalued by the government, um, and that caused chloride to decline pretty quickly. Um, this is the Pioneer Store, which was built in 1880 and actually didn't close till 1923, so it, it persisted for a while. It was bought in 1989 by a Mr. and Mrs. Edmund. And um, what I love about, about this is that this is a photo on, on the left here that Philip, Philip Barney took in 1981. And here I took this photo uh, much later in the, in the 2000 teens. And I wonder if when Varney took this photo, I'm sure he didn't know, but behind the corrugated tin and the boarded up windows was everything that had been in the store in 1923. So um, the Edmonds spent a lot of time cleaning this up, uh, cleaning up all the things inside and then making a fantastic museum out of it. So there's just tons of farm implements, mining implements, things of the day, like a child's coffin, this beautiful um, safe Victorian clothing. There's whiskey bottles that are half full. I believe there's a printing press inside. It's just like stepping into uh, a general store or a mercantile from the turn of the century. It's really a wonderful museum and, and well worth a visit. A place that actually has much less going on in that regard is Kelly, which is south of Highway 60 near Magdalena. Um, in 1866, Colonel Old Hutch, Hutchison, filed a couple of mining claims out here. He gave one to Andy Kelly, a friend of his, and then jumped Andy Kelly's claim. So um, Kelly's named for someone who never actually um, mined this area. I also, um, I often like to 
figure out what the um, place names of these of these uh, locations are, you know, where they came from. You can learn a lot about the history just by knowing why it was named what it was. So they mined silver and lead here initially. The town was laid out about 1870 and uh, Kelly boomed. It said the peak population was about 3,000. It's not uncommon for these estimates to be really inflated, as we'll see in a moment. It's possible that Kelly really did have 3,000 people, though, in this particular case. Um, it said that beds were rented in eight-hour shifts, so someone would come and, and mine um, for eight or 12 hours, get tired, come to take a, a nap, and you know the person who had the bed would then go out and do, do their own mining. So um, there might have been a lot of activity here. This is the Tribullion smelter, which is a great ruin out there. So uh, Kelly got kind of a second mining wind with zinc and smithsonite. Um, this is a great photo of Kelly in its prime taken by Joseph Edward Smith, who documented a lot of what was happening in the Socorro area um, around that time. As I said, here's the Tribullion smelter, just a great evocative mining ruin. And uh, the zinc ran out in the 1930s and Kelly quickly turned into a near ghost town. There are, I think, a couple people out there uh, still to this day who live in the church, which is, is maintained. Um, but this is a shot of, I guess, downtown Kelly. All those houses, to my understanding, were meticul meticulously taken apart, board by board, and then rebuilt in Magdalena or elsewhere. So you don't see any of that anymore. Um, there's some foundations and things out there, but, but you would be very hard pressed to um, imagine it in its heyday when you're out there, but it's very peaceful, very quiet, um, and a nice place to visit. Again, these evocative head frames and mining ruins are, are wonderful. There are some open shafts, so it's also a dangerous place to visit. You want to stay away from, from those open shafts. I believe that more than a few people have fallen down them over, over the years, so it, there can be some danger when you're visiting ghost towns. Um, Elizabeth Town, which we saw earlier, is another uh, wonderful ghost town on the Enchanted Circle, northeast of Taos. Uh, it was originally a tent camp for gold, prospect, gold prospectors who were working uh, Mount Baldy across the way there in the 1860s. This is near Wheeler Peak. Um, it was named for the five-year-old daughter of Captain W. Moore, who built the first house here. I'm told that this vehicle is a 1947 Mercury. I don't know my cars, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna take that as being true. It's, it's clearly been there for quite a while. It has a very nice view. So here's a place where the population was uh, said to be 3,000, 5,000, 7,000. Those are certainly far too high. It was probably more like 800. Um, and again, the legends and lore of these ghost towns are often um, pretty fascinating. So a serial killer named Charles Kennedy um, operated in this area. He reportedly killed travelers and buried them in the basement. Um, his son, I believe it was, went and told the authorities at some point or kind of spilled the beans. And so a mob came and reportedly it was Clay Allison who decapitated him and Henry Lambert is said to have hung his head outside the St. James Hotel in Cimarron. The first part of that is, is true about Charles Kennedy. I have not seen any, um, any firm evidence of particularly the head being hung outside the St. James Hotel, but it could be true. It certainly makes for um, a real Wild West kind of story. Here's another one where it said that this was such a rough and tumble place that um, some criminal wanted to get a, a change of venue so he could get a fair trial. He was also taken by a mob. He was hanged with the word so much for change of venue pinned to his chest. I don't know whether that's true myself, but um, again, this is sort of, you find these kinds of stories typically um, attached to these places and some of them it's worth kind of taking with a grain of salt, but they're, they're all <laughs> typically pretty interesting. Um, so by 1875, Elizabethtown was in pretty severe decline, but it was actually revived for a bit by the railroad, by the Atchison, Topeka and Santa Fe um, this is Froelich's store, which is said to be the last original relatively um, unaltered building. And there are some other ruins of original buildings nearby, particularly the, uh, what I believe is the Mutz Hotel, which is just some stone ruins at this point. But that was a very big hotel in its day. Um, 
agricultural ghost towns. So Clanch is a great example of agricultural ghost towns. This is west of US 54, southwest of Corona. It was settled around 1890 as Dubois Flats and renamed for uh, renamed Clanch for a local rancher, L.H. Clanch, who had a, a cattle company. This was about 1930 when it finally became Clanch. So it really flourished for a time because of pinto beans. This is the center of the state. This is what was then the pinto bean empire of Mountaineer, Willard, Cedarvale, places like that where dryland farming was producing pinto beans. This was um, huge in feeding the troops in World War I in particular. Um, so a lot of farming going on in this area. And then of course, you know, right around the time that Clanch actually became Clanch, um, the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl arrived. And, and as with many places in the country, Clanch never really recovered from um, that one-two punch. Well, one of the interesting things that happened in Clanch is the Torrance County Singing Convention, which started in 1916. This was four major events held each year rooted in a religious tradition from the 1700s in New England. As far as I can tell, this is something like um, shape note singing, which is a very phonetic way of singing very old religious songs. Um, this was a yearly statewide convention, could bring as many as 1,200 people to Clanch, which is really amazing to think about when you're in Clanch. I believe the population now is less than seven. This is the Clanch, Clanch Women's Club which is um, still operating. And this over here on the left was the Pinto Bean Museum, which was derelict for a number of years. It's recently been purchased. I don't think it'll be a museum again, but it, it should be shored up and, and used by the family that has, has purchased it. Um, this is a great description of what went on in Clanch. This is from Ralph Looney in his Haunted Highways book from the mid 1960s when he saw what was probably one of the last of these conventions. And I'm not gonna go through all the food that he saw um, on the tables, but you know, roast chicken, tossed salads, potato salad, yeast rolls, lots of desserts, vanilla cake, white cake, um, on and on and on. So what they would do is they would sing in the morning, they would have this major spread for lunch in the afternoon, and then they would sing for another three hours. These are songs like Joy is Coming, When the Roll is Called Up Yonder. Um, religious songs of that nature. So really, um, when you're in Clanch, you know, it's very quiet, it's very still, you, you know, try to imagine all the singing and all the music that was made in this, in this town. This is the WPA school in Clanch, which closed in the 1950s. New Mexico has a number of wonderful WPA structures. A lot of them are not in very good condition, so I've always tried to visit and document as many as I can. And this is the school in Clutch. Um, so a lot of these ghost towns sort of had um, front row seats for a lot of what was happening um, in the country at large. Clutch is a good example of that. It was very close to White Sands and the Trinity Test. And this graphic here on the right shows ground zero. It shows Clanch, the star, and the prevailing wind at that time when the bomb went off was to the northeast. So fallout came right over Clanch. I've heard of livestock that was bleached white and taken to state fairs as a curiosity. People just didn't know what had happened. They didn't know what the impacts were. I've received letters from people um, who grew up here and they say that they have cancer or their friends have cancer, or their family has cancer. And a lot of people are trying to get recognition for the effects of that blast. Um, the specific group is the Tularosa Basin uh, Downwinders Consortium, I believe that's the, the full name. They're just trying to get some recognition for the effects of, of this blast. Um, and so, yeah, Clanch, Clanch really um, did, or worse in this case, have a front row seat to a major event in, in US history. This is another agricultural ghost town near Fort Sumner. This is Dunlap, which was settled during that early 20th century homestead boom. This was founded by W.O. Dunlap. I was trying to visit this for a very long time, spe specifically to see this building, the Dunlap Community School and Church, which I'd heard a lot about. So this is one of those places where homesteaders just um, couldn't make a go of it. The, the land was, was a little bit too unforgiving. 
and uh, the post office closed in 1961. There's no trace of that left. But this school and church is really fondly remembered. Um, they had dances here, they had parties, the community would, would meet to discuss things. And this is common throughout the messages that I've received is that these places are really remembered very warmly. People have very fond memories and they're often very wistful and sometimes just you know downright sad to see what's happened to these places that meant so much to them and their family. And unfortunately, this, this building has recently collapsed as well. So it is no longer upright. It's just um, a pile of debris. Um, Cabazon is a fantastic ghost town off of uh, US 550, northwest of Albuquerque, Hispano Agricultural Settlement in the Rio Puerco Valley, which is one of my favorite areas in the world. Um, this was settled in 1826 by Juan Mestas from Pagosa Springs, Colorado. It's associated with an older settlement called La Posta, which was a stage stop on the route from Santa Fe. If you read the works of Nazario Garcia, um, he'll often refer to these two places um, as the same, more or less, Cabazon, La Posta. They're kind of interchangeable. This is a great shot down um, Main Street, Cabazon, with the church at the back, which is maintained. Cabazon is a difficult place to visit. Uh, the road to it is closed off or gated. One person lives here pretty much full time and he's afraid that people are gonna come and his cows are gonna injure the visitors to Cabazon. I was lucky enough to get an invitation on the day that I, I took these shots. So to the Navajo, Cabazon Peak was the head of a giant killed on Mount Taylor. Um, this was the eastern edge of the Navajo world until the Spanish explored west of what they called Cabazon or Big Head. So there were things going on here um, long before some of these places became the ghost town or the towns that we, we think of when we think of them as ghost towns. Um, obviously, New Mexico, just hundreds of years of history, layer upon layer in these places. Um, this is a, a hotel old hotel uh, that apparently had 11 rooms. So there was definitely a lot going on in Cabazon. Um, shepherds, uh, sheep herders would come here with their wool um, and load it up for wagons to Albuquerque. So that's one of the things that happened in Cabazon. Uh, Richard F. Heller, he arrived here in 1888 and bought, this, uh, bought a trading post in 1874. He built this trading post himself in 1910. Um, you can see some dovecoats up there in the roof. So he raised, he raised birds here. And he stayed in Cabazon until his death in 1947. And then the town immediately began to decline. Um, he, he really was Cabazon. And when he left, uh, when he passed away, that, that was really the end. You can see some great footage of Cabazon in a film called The Hired Hand, which I believe is a Henry Fonda film, um, really worth seeing the hired hand and taking a look at what Cabazon looked like uh, in the 19, late 1960s, I believe is when that film was made. Um, so railroad ghost towns, New Mexico has a number of those. This is Taiban on US Highway 60, west of Clovis, uh, which we saw you know, on the very first slide. So the Atchison, Topeka and Santa Fe Railroad staked out a number of towns in the Eastern Plains about 1906 along what became known as the Berlin Cutoff. They were really looking for a way to move trains across the state that wasn't up through Raton Pass, which has a very steep grade. So this was a flat piece of the state that they could move trains through more easily. It's named for Taiban Creek. Taiban may refer to horsetail, which is a primitive type of plant, or it may refer to something like three creeks coming together in this area. No one really knows what Taiban means. Um, the peak population here was about 400, mostly farmers and uh, sheep herders. This is the Taiban trading post on, on Highway 60 right there. If you look through the window, you can see a Ross Perot uh, campaign shirt hanging on a rack. I guess that's what, the 19, 1980s probably. So that, that shirt has maybe been there for a while. Um, again, talking about, you know, uh, larger popular history, Billy the Kid spent some time in Taiban. Um, he and his gang were captured in um, a place called Stinking Springs, which is essentially uh, Taiban. Uh, this is a picture of the cabin that he and his gang uh, had to hide out in with Pat Garrett outside. Charlie Beaudry was killed here. 
this cabin is gone, although the imprint of it can still be seen on the ground. Someone sent me some, some great photos from, I think, a drone or something. I haven't had a chance to go out and look at the site itself. It's on private ranch land, um, but um, you can plainly see where this was, and I'd sure like to get out there sometime. So uh, maybe somebody will give me an invitation. So here again is the first Presbyterian Church of Taiban. As I said, this is one of my favorite places to visit. Um, this was completed on December 22nd, 1908. Cost about $250 to build. Less than 100 of that could be covered by the congregation. I believe the Baptist Church loaned them some money to, to finish building this. Um, the first sermon was, was held by John R. Gass, sparsely attended due to cold weather. It gets windy, it gets cold out there. And um, in the early days, this, this was a tough place to, to set up house. Um, a lot of people visit this church. They write prayers on the walls. Um, it's just really, um, like I said, a very evocative place to be. My understanding is that in the last year or two, maybe some of the steeple has started to, to come apart even more. So it's weathering fast, um, unfortunately. Taiban was also known um, for bootlegging. Uh, West Texas was dry. People would actually fly their planes in to get alcohol from West Texas. This is the Taiban airport with the high school in the back. That's really hard to imagine. Now all that is gone. Um, there was a place called the Pink Pony Saloon and Dance Hall, which featured cockfights and a snake pit. That building still exists. I believe it's a horse boarding uh, facility, just a little bit to the east of, I guess, what you would call downtown Taiban. Um, the cockfights in the snake pit were actually advertised on flyers. One of those is in the Billy the Kid Museum in Fort Sumner. The last church service was held in 1936, although I think they still had things going on there later than that, like weddings and events. Um, but by 1960, the only business functioning in Taiban was a bar. So uh, make of that what you will. Here's the Taiban church when it still had its bell and you can see the high school uh, there behind it. That high school is long gone. There are maybe just some bricks left back there. Uh, Yeso is another uh, wonderful railroad ghost town. One of my favorite ghost towns. A lot of intact neighborhoods, a lot of intact um, structures out in Yeso. Um, again, this was Atchison, Topeka and Santa Fe coming through here with the Berlin cutoff in 1906. Uh, Yeso translates as gypsum, which is a reference to what really made the water undrinkable for the residents, but was fine for the trains, apparently. Um, and then it added another S in 1909 for some reason. No one knows why that happened. Um, this is the uh, Yucca Hotel, which I'm sure was a, a railroad hotel where people just walked across the tracks across the road and then you know spent a night or two in the hotel. I've never seen uh, a picture of of the hotel in its heyday, but I'd sure love to. Eventually it became a frontier museum, I guess, um, and is now clearly in the final stages of uh, deterioration, but just really a great, um, a great ghost town. So as I mentioned, um, after World War II, steam engines were replaced by diesel and the, the train just went right past these places. So no one needed to really stay at the, at the Yucca Hotel. Um, and the surrounding land just was not very good for farming, and these places quickly began to um, diminish. This is the super service drive-in, which I'm sure was a garage filling station, maybe. Um, all that's left is the walls, but just a remarkable construction. That stonework is just, just fantastic. You can often find a lot of interesting ephemera still in these places. Um, I was told about this uh, being put in the concrete in, in bottle caps, this phrase established June 8th, 1929. You just get a feel for, you know, the kind of, of care that people put into these places. They really um, put a lot of themselves into their homes and their businesses. And clearly they intended to stay here for their, their whole lives. And they probably hoped that their um, children would stay here as well. Um, I had to dig some of this out. I went I went looking for it specifically one day and found it under some, some plaster. So I was glad that it was still there for the most part. And I was able to take some photos of it. Uh, this is Ancho, which we saw a little bit earlier. Um, this is uh, north of Carrizozo. So, so down there sort of in the central part of the state. This Here's the El Paso and Northeastern Railroad that came through the Ancho Valley in 1899. Um, 
Gypsum was also discovered here, but it was used for plaster. So a plaster mill was built. And then in 1905, the Anshul Brick Company was created to utilize um, the abundant fire clay in the area. So I always imagine that this little house is um, a worker's house for someone who was making bricks. I don't know if that's actually true, but that's kind of what I think of when I look at that. These are the wonderful bricks that were made in Ancho. Really, um, really nice. This photo was actually taken in Ancho, which I'll um, mention where that was in a second. So Phelps Dodge purchased the brick plant in 1917. They enlarged it and then shut it down shortly after that. Just four years later, they were in bankruptcy. In 1954, US 54 cut off Ancho by over two miles on the route between Corona and Carrizozo. So this is a town that was also affected by just being cut off of one of the main uh, regional byways. And then in 1959, the railroad shuttered the depot. And that was really um, pretty much the end of, of Ancho. But where I took this photo is out in front of this, um, of the depot, which for a while was just what sounds like an incredible museum called My House of Old Things, which collected a lot of regional artifacts and ephemera. Um, it was purchased in 1963 by uh, Mrs. Jackie Silvers. Philip Varney saw it in its glory in, in the late 70s or very early 1980s, and he called it a wonderful conglomeration of all the things you thought nobody had saved. Um, when I got there, I could look through the windows and see that it had been mostly cleared out. There were a few things. I'm told that um, the family just wasn't interested in, in maintaining it, and so a lot of those things were sold on eBay. This is now fenced off, so you can't actually go up and look in the windows anymore. There was one elderly resident in Anshul when I visited. I, I sadly think he's passed away. So Anshul may now be a complete ghost town. On the other side of the spectrum, San Antonio is, is far from a complete ghost town. The, the Albar is there, famous Albar, um, but it's not the bustling place it was back when there was a lot of mining in the area and a lot of activity with the railroad. So San Antonio may have been a village as early as 1600. Um, Hispanic settlers from northern New Mexico named the town after a mission in 1820. And it was once again the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railroad that came through here later in the 1800s. This is a privately owned railroad building. You can see the pilings are listing here. Um, this may topple over fairly, fairly soon if it's not shored up. There's also some wonderful graffiti inside this. The family let me go inside one day and, and some really great um, graffiti from the early part of the 1900s. So I always like to mention San Antonio because of its history with A.H. Hilton. He came here in the 1880s and opened a mercantile and hotel. His son, who was Conrad, was born in 1887 and as a young boy would carry luggage from uh, the train depot to his dad's hotel. This is a great shot of the Hilton Mercantile. On the other side of the street is the post office, which is maintained as a private residence these days. And of course, Conrad would go on to establish the Hilton Hotel chain. So again, you know, um, something that occurred on the world stage um, also impacted a small little now semi-ghost town in, in uh, central New Mexico. This is also the origins of Paris Hilton, if you want to look at it that way. I don't know if these are really the foundations of the Hilton Mercantile or not. This is where the Mercantile was. And the latest news I have is that hopefully a historic marker will be put up here sometime in the not too distant future, commemorating the beginning of uh, the Hilton hotel chain and um, Hilton's mercantile store at this, at this site. Well, finally, we've got ghost towns of the Mother Road, Route 66 in particular. This is Newkirk, west of Tucumcari. Again, the railroad played a role here. The Chicago, Rock Island, and Pacific came through about 1901. Um, Newkirk was named in honor of a town in Oklahoma, which is where I happen to be at the moment. Um, and that was the home of a former resident of, um, or of a resident of Newkirk. This is on the south side of, of I-40 now. On the north side of I-40 um, are most of the buildings um, in Newkirk. So with the arrival of Route 66, the population actually um, went up to about 240. And then by the 1940s, even though Newkirk at that point had four gas stations, a couple restaurants, a trading post, a post office, and some rental cabins, the population was already 
um, cutting in more than half. Uh, so this is the original post office there on the right, I believe. Um, and on the left is a church that's lost its steeple. Uh, that building in particular is in worse shape um, every time I see it. There is actually a functioning gas station in Newkirk. It's the only functioning gas station, I think, um, between Tucumcari and Santa Rosa, although I think maybe the gas station in Corvo is operating again too. So I'll mention Corvo in a moment here as well. Um, so this is a great example of a comment that someone left, an anonymous person who had lived in Newkirk at five years of age. And they said, I recall people coming through with as many as 10 people in a car with all manner of things, chicken coops, mattresses, et cetera, tied atop the cars. Some of them traded possessions for gasoline. Many drove through the night when it was cooler. So here's someone who had a front row seat uh, for one of the biggest migrations in American history from the sidewalk in Newkirk. So really just amazing to think about. This was Wilkerson's gas station, which um, was run by the family until 1989 when they finally had to close it. And you can see that building is definitely um, not long for the world. It's, it's about to cave in. This is Corvo, which I mentioned a second ago, um, not too far from Newkirk, just a little bit west, located on a trade route, which was active since the 1500s. Also established with the Chicago, Rock Island and Pacific Railroad. Corvo means crow, named for a hill not too far away, Corvo Hill. Here's a picture I took with that 120 medium format film, very, very cheap film stock, but I love the fact that it has this sort of um, strange striation to it. Uh, I really <laughs> find that stuff uh, interesting. It sort of um, speaks to my artsy side, I guess. Um, so in 1910, cattle and sheep ranching expanded into this area, but it was really Route 66 that caused Corvo to kind of, of grow. It had two of everything when Route 66 was there, two schools, two churches, two doctors, two hotels. This was the post office and a grocery store. You can still make out Corvo, New Mexico, barely up there um, at the top of the building. This is my favorite building in Corvo, the old district number six school built around 1930 and closed in 1958. This is the inside of it. When I walked in there, I was just immediately struck by how it felt to be inside this building, the beautiful patina on the walls. You can see the outline of the blackboard there, this wood burning stove. Um, this was purchased by an elderly lady in 2012 uh, for just over $10,000. And she did restore some of it. She put a, I know she put a roof on there. She shored it up a little bit. So this scene is definitely gone. I'm not sure um, what she's doing in that building at this point, if she's staying there sometimes or, or what the ultimate use is. It seemed like the restoration went, you know, only so far and then, and then kind of stopped. And I should mention at this point that um, Corvo, some of these places are not super welcoming to visitors. They, they don't really um, like people roaming around some of these buildings with very good reason. They're dangerous. There's liability. So Corvo has put up signs that say no parking anytime along what are almost deserted streets. Um, and so I don't recommend that people go there for that, for that reason. And when you're visiting a ghost town, these are often people's homes. And it's really worth remembering that you should be very respectful. People will come up and talk to you. Um, you should talk to them. If you know a little history beforehand, it will help that conversation. Often people are very forthcoming and welcoming and they'll tell you as much as they know. They're just happy that someone's interested um, in the place that they live in. And um, so that's really something to keep in mind when you're going to these places and a lot of private property as well. So um, I can't uh, stress that enough to be, to be respectful. Um, finally, as far as Route 66, on the far western side of the state, we've got Blue Water, which is west of Grants. This is a place the Navajo is referred to as large cottonwood trees where water flows out. Uh, when Route 66 came through, a lot of trading posts popped up in western New Mexico, in the eastern Arizona. Um, those crafts were, uh, and, and art were sort of um, exotic to people from the Midwest or, or from the east. And so, um, a lot, of, a lot of commerce was done along Route 66. Uh, this is one of those trading posts, the rattlesnake trading post. There was also really um, a lot of interest in, in exotic reptiles like, like rattlesnakes themselves. Um, 
Jake and Maxine Atkinson bought this building in 1946 and for a while had the largest collection of cobras in the US in this building, which is really hard to imagine. You can still see Rattle SN, the Rattlesnake Trading Post up there at the top. And this is the Rattlesnake Trading Post in its heyday. Um, also hard to imagine when you're out there. So in 1951, it was sold to Maxine Atkinson's sister and then it kind of faded away. I, I don't know the history of it after that, but um, just really uh, a Route 66 relic, like really in um, sort of um, exemplary uh, trading post of the time. So I'll finish up here with just a little ghost town philosophy, uh, if you will, just, you know, just some thoughts about why we're attracted to ghost towns. This is the Fraser School in Chavez County, um, very near Roswell, just a great stone building. I mean, you can see the craftspersonship that went into, into that, really, um, really an amazing building. A complete ghost town, Fraser, is um, adjacent to a place called Acme, also a complete ghost town. So this is an example of, of a place where there is nobody anymore. Um, so, you know, I often talk to other ghost town aficionados, just people in general, about why we're attracted to ghost towns. What is it that we, we um, find about them that's so evocative? This is Cedarvale in the Pinto Bean Empire. Um, we call this building the Danger Snakes Building for obvious reasons. Um, I've never seen a snake near this building, but I'm, I'm sure they're there. So it's always a good idea to heed, to heed the signs in ghost towns because they're, they're probably there for a good reason. So are we longing for times we never knew what, the, what in Portuguese is called sedaje, um, something that we've, we've lost and can never get back, or maybe something that we never knew and wish we had known? Um, I think that that is an element of what we feel in ghost towns. This is the Mission Church of Santa Acacia um, in Socorro County. This was hit by uh, floods on the Rio Grande, which is very nearby on two separate occasions that was washed away. Um, this is a very evocative church um, to be in. You can still walk through it. It looks like some people still go in there to pray. Just behind me in this photo is the old school, which now they run horseback trips out of. So if you go down to that area, you might wanna take a horseback trip, um, which would be, um, this would be a spectacular area to go horseback riding. Is it nostalgia for, for this vanished lifestyle and economy? Um, you know, given the complexity of modern life, the digital age, do we just want something similar, something slower, something less expensive? This is the Curry Mercantile in Duran in Torrance County. This is a great uh, vintage photo of the Curry Mercantile with Anton Curry actually there on the right. Um, I went and photographed this building uh, presently, uh, I think maybe just a couple of years ago. And when I photographed it, I didn't really know its history. This is a good example of how I used to work, where I would just go to a place, photograph it, then learn the history of the building. Turns out that this um, was a place where uh, a murder occurred. Anton Curry was, was killed here by assailants. His son, uh, this is in the middle of the night, his son drove the assailants out by throwing cans of food at them. And so they left, three of them were captured, one escaped to Mexico, and those three men were hung. Those were the last judicial hangings in the state of New Mexico. And I had no idea when I photographed that building that that's what happened there. So it's really worth doing your research beforehand so you kind of know what you're looking at when you're there but um, really an interesting thing to learn about that building the, the curry mercantile it is worth remembering especially these days when we're in year two of a pandemic that you know this was an often hard and sometimes tragic life out there on the on the um, on the plains in particular and um, you know you often go to cemeteries and see families that have died in very short order. Pandemics like yellow fever, of course, tuberculosis was rampant at uh, much of this time. And I have to be careful not to romanticize the past too much because these, these were difficult places to be, but also these were very resilient, um, strong-willed people to come out here on the frontier and really do their best to set up a life for themselves and in some cases succeed quite well. So very, very hardy folks out there in these places. Um, and, you know, sort of along with 
some of what we're going through now is that the way we live does change and, and nothing is truly permanent. And what we think is going to be there forever. I'm sure a lot of these people in these ghost towns thought that they had moved into a place that would persist for decades and decades. And in many cases, that didn't happen. Um, and people had to move on and find a different way to live. This is the old schoolhouse in Hickoria in Lincoln County. Um, again, just a wonderful, wonderful structure to go visit and photograph. I've been told there were dances in this building um, and it's just really, the construction is, is fantastic. So just a great place to go visit down there in, in Lincoln County. Sometimes I'm not even sure how to describe um, what I'm seeing or feeling, which is why I think that the photographs are still so important to me. This is the Amistad School in Union County taken with that, that medium format film. This is a WPA school. Um, and you can imagine all the students coming and going from this school over the years. And, and there might not be any more students in this school ever again. It's um, not in the best condition. And there's very few people living in this area at this point. And also just, you know, the architecture, the care that went into construction, we saw that gas station in, in Yeso, uh, it's constructed of rock, just the care that people put into what they were making. I've seen abandoned Walmarts, they're very difficult to photograph in any sort of uh, interesting or artistic way. And, and this could be anywhere. So it is interesting to consider like, what are we creating for posterity with big box stores and, and fast food restaurants. There's, there's not maybe going to be as much interest in these places. We've all seen abandoned fast food restaurants and not many people are out there photographing those. And it is worth always keeping in mind that this does reflect a continuing problem both in rural New Mexico and throughout the United States. Um, in New Mexico, the population of 20 of 33 counties declined in the last 10 years. Those are rural counties. And today, only about 14% of the U.S. is rural. Uh, that's quite a change from um, historic highs. So 46 million people versus 270 million people in rural areas. Um, this is the Corona Trading Company in Lincoln County. Here's the proprietor watering some, some flowers out there. Established in 1902, and sadly, this closed a few years ago. There's just not many people um, driving U.S. 54 and stopping at the trading company anymore. Interestingly, in the last couple of years, there has been a glimmer of a reversal. And people are um, still in small numbers, but noticeably moving back to smaller towns and rural areas, whether that's because of COVID. Remote working, of course, has made that feasible um, when it wasn't previously. People are wanting to escape the high cost of living in other places. We've had some serious uh, issues with um, climate change and weather disasters like fires and floods. It'll be interesting to see if this trend uh, gathers steam and, and continues in the, um, in the future. But there is just a little glimmer of, of people starting to come back to some of these places. So that, that will be interesting to watch. So um, I haven't been able to do posts on the blog in the last couple of years because I was working on the book, which took all my time, but I do try to maintain the City of Dust Facebook page at least um, as often as I can. So there are many more ghost towns, more history, more historic buildings on Facebook, um, facebook.cityofdustnm. Of course, people leave comments here, their recollections, their histories. So it functions like the blog, but I would really like to now that the book is done, get out and um, do some, some more in-depth posts on the City of Dust blog. I've got enough material. I've got enough material for a second book. I just need the time to sit down and, and write the histories. I've got the photos and I've got the location. So New Mexico is just um, full of these, these historic places. So that's uh, what I have for tonight. So thank you all for tuning in virtually. Hopefully we can do this in person. Uh, before too long, thank you to Daniel Goodman and all at El Rancho de los Galandrinas for inviting me. It's really an honor. Um, I didn't ever think when I was taking uh, my initial photos with a disposable camera, I should mention, in Georgia, that you know one day it would lead to giving a talk like, like this. So I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled and, and humbled and also um, a little bit taken aback by where this has led me. So 
Thank you. Also, thanks to Philip Varney for letting me um, borrow a lot out of his book unwittingly, and my friend Bob Julian, who does actually know that I um, steal from him all the time. So thanks to those two, and thanks to everyone that sent me memories, photos of these places, uh, and let me use them. I, I you know it's really means a lot that people um, trust what I do enough to kind of share what are often very vulnerable um, feelings and very personal recollections. So thanks to all of them. And of course, once again, thanks to you uh, for being here. I'll just mention this is Monticello in Sierra County, which is also just um, a fantastic, charming place to go and visit with a wonderful um, WPA school that's in ruins, but very, very good to uh, go and photograph. So again, thank you. And if you have questions, you can contact me through Facebook. I'm happy to reply. I try to reply to everybody. So good night. Thank you for joining us this evening and helping to celebrate our 50th anniversary season. Please also look out for more of our Golandrinus live sessions featuring lectures, New Mexico traditions, and lifeways. Event details will be posted on our website, social media pages, Facebook and Instagram, both at SF Golandrinus. All our videos remain on our Facebook page and are also posted to the Las Golandrinas channel on YouTube. To subscribe to our newsletter, volunteer, and more, visit golandrinas.org. We open for tours in April. Call the office to schedule yours today. Self-guided tours start in June. We look forward to welcoming you to Las Golandrinas, wishing you all a safe and joyful evening. We will see you next time right here on the Golandrinas Live Sessions, your connection to the history and cultures of New Mexico. Thank you.